You are listening to the Terroir Podcast on Paris Underground Radio. Okay, welcome back to the Terroir Podcast. Welcome. I'm so excited to be chatting with you again, Emily, about our favorite subject, which is what? Food and booze in France. Food and booze. Yeah, seriously. And we are traveling this week to one of my favorite uh, regions for a number of reasons that we'll get into. Um, But specifically, we're talking about Normandy and we're going to be talking a little bit about Vikings. Everyone loves a Viking, right? Normandy is a place that is interesting for me because, well, for you, it's pretty close to Paris. So I think a lot of people that live in Paris go to Normandy a lot. It's pretty far from me in Lyon, but I have been there once. I went with my dad to go to the D-Day beaches, which is what what Americans know it of. You know, they know it really about the World War II beaches, which are just kind of beautiful, sad beaches with weird energy um, (laughs) and then cemeteries. But there's so much more there than just that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the vibe that you get when you go out to that specific part of Normandy. And I used to, speaking of Paris, I used to run bus tours out there for American tourists who only wanted to spend one day in Normandy, which I understand, you know, you come to France. Not enough. It's not enough. It's like people want to come here. They want to stay in Paris. And they're like, oh, Normandy, it's not that far away. First of all, we as Americans are used to being like, it's not that far away. I'm going to drive six hours somewhere. (laughs) I have family, a lot of family in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And that's how they they're like yeah we're just gonna we're just gonna hop in the car for us i'm like are you fucking kidding me <laughs> like i'm not i'm not spending four hours in the car there's no way like that's like a for me that's a like full-on road trip like if i'm in the car i can't i have to stop i have to get out i have to like stretch my legs get a coffee i have to do something I, after two hours i cannot drive all day right and i i mean i was doing these driving tours where i was thankfully not driving really at this point i'm trying to get my french driver's license but at this point in my life right now i would recommend people not get in a car with me in the driver's seat <laughs> it's just like for your sanity for my sanity for our friendship it's probably not a good idea but i was not the driver on these tours i was the uh tour guide and so i you know got my history of world war ii down pat but there is like you said so much more to normandy than d-day and then these you know sad beaches, which are now, I mean, they're sad, but they're also just beaches. They're just beaches. I think that's what people don't realize. They're like, they want, they think there's going to be a lot of stuff there. And it's like, it's just, it's just a beach. Yeah. Where a lot of people died. (laughs) Where a lot of people died and where the Vikings arrived. And where the Vikings arrived. That's, you know, that was probably in. Holy non sequitur, Batman. (laughs) Interesting. um, That probably a lot of people died when that happened too, but maybe not as many. I mean, there was probably also a lot of rape and there was definitely a lot of pillaging. Pillaging and rape. So, I mean, when you even look at just at the etymology of the word Normandy, Normandy in French with the IE on the end, it has links to Norsemen or the Northmen. So that's what, you know, we're calling the Vikings at this time. Normand. Normand, Normand. And they get in, uh, they get to the Normandy coast um, in the 9th century AD. They are coming over from Denmark. And they actually end up raping, pillaging, plundering, and just kind of like hanging out in Normandy from the 9th century until the mid-13th century. It's a long time. It's a very long time. And the reason they're able to do this is basically because France's rulers are like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. Which is a choice that gets made in general, like geopolitical history a lot more often than we, I think, talk about it. But like, that's like a really like a defensive move for like, how about you don't take my whole country, but I'll let you like take that little bit that's like far from my castle. Well, let's remember that France wasn't a country either. Like, not really, you know, and and at this time, we have sort of kingdoms that are that are smaller and, and are always kind of borders are always changing. And it's just like, whichever dude, you know, thinks he has the biggest dick is gonna take the most land at that point. So I mean, accurate. (laughs) I mean, we do. So at this point, we have a guy, um, a guy, a dude, Philip Augustus in Paris, who is king of France for all intents and purposes. But he does build like the very first or the the biggest fortification wall around Paris, which at this point is really only going to be like the first five or so arrondissement of the now 20 arrondissement city. And he's building that wall. I mean, people say to protect Paris from the English, but really it's to protect Paris from the Vikings who are hanging out in Normandy, which is a, you know, four hour 
bus drive, <laughs> several day, you know, mounted jaunt from uh, from Normandy. So, I mean, Google will tell you how long it takes to walk there. So we right? can figure that. I love that. But it's like, it will take you seven days. And it, does, <laughs> it does give you some perspective. Yeah. I do think it is worth saying, because you know I'm that bitch, that before this period, like during the Roman period, Leon was the capital of Roman France, Roman Gaul, right? Mm -hmm. And Paris was basically like backwater, nothing. Okay, you had like the world's tiniest amphitheater, which is one of my favorite places in Paris. But just saying, just saying. And it's still there. People who do come to Paris, that world's tiniest amphitheater is there. And like high school kids hang out there and have their lunch. It's great. I discovered that place totally by accident once. I was just walking past and there's like a plaque. It's like the Roman amphitheater was like, what? And you walk through this like random door and then it's just sitting there. And it's, it's so cool. I, I love that. I love that so much. I mean, it's, 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 France has like a weird, really, or had a weird relationship with preserving its antiquity. And so the fact that that still exists is really only due to the fact that it was buried for such a long time. And they like dug it up when they were trying to build a massive boulevard. And by then it was like cool to maintain well, your Roman ruins. So they were like, cool, let's do it. No, Hausman and Napoleon were like, no, we want to build a boulevard. And then all the like thinkers, like Victor Hugo was like, no, right. We're, we're keeping this. And like these sort of like philosophers and artists and writers got together and saved it, which I think is delightful. It is delightful. And that, that particular Napoleon was also the one who tried to convince all the French that they were descended from the Gauls, which they were not. <laughs> they were Vikings. They were Vikings or, um, you know, Normans, Norsemen, um, the most famous of whom is William the Conqueror, who invades England in 1066, which is why we have like dual control of England and Normandy for, you know, 200 years, basically. Um, And that's why there's so many French words in English. I didn't know he was a Viking. He was. I mean, he was a Norman. So he he was a descendant of the Vikings. I thought he was English and tried to conquer France. <laughs> Wait a second. Hold on. I got it wrong. I'm no, sure. maybe I got it wrong. Oh Let's... God, we have to Google this now. I know we do, and Please I'm gonna keep this in, Jennifer. <laughs> we're pe- we're just humans. We oh know stuff, but we forget it. We drink too much. No, I have no. Yeah, I thought he no, was. No, first Norman monarch. You're right. You're right. Thank you're right. God. You're right. No. Okay, the, but the only reason the only reason I really need to be right about this is that I was a linguistics major in college, and one of the only things that I remember that's actually useful is like this whole double like the fact that we basically spoke High Norman French in both England and in France for two hundred years, which is why English looks the way it does. And if I had gotten it backwards, it would have just like undone. <laughs> your entire anything, brain would have unraveled into learned. a spool of thread <laughs> and I w- it would have been like well that was all the jaegermeister that was it god jaeger when are we gonna do an episode where we can inc- talk about jaeger oh my god is that please. french uh, i don't th- sure it's french scary deer on the front <laughs> i think jaeger's um german jaeger is german and okay. it is legally disgusting it is very disgusting so um <laughs> But back to Normandy. So oh. Normandy. So Normandy. We ha- so we have William the Conqueror. I'm a big old linguistics nerd. But the but the the important part about the Great Engl- English vowel shift, which isn't necessarily to do with Normandy, but it does have to do with the way that we talk about food in French and English, is that uh, in so we had like a, a proto you like old English Saxon type language that was being spoken in England before William the Conqueror got there, and when he got to England, um, we end up speaking high Norman French in the courts. And so you end up with a language that, you know, English has about four times as many words as French does today. Don't tell French people that. They would be mad. I tell them all the time. It is my greatest joy. French people think they love to say that like French is a super, they think it's, they are told, okay. French children are told in school that like French is very, very difficult. And they like think it's like one of the world's hard languages, which it's definitely not. (laughs) Like it's not. No, no. It's not Arabic. It's not Russian. It's not Mandarin. (laughs) Like calm down. Right. I mean, it's not English, which has like all of these, they say in France that the exception is what makes the rule. But in, I mean, English is just exceptions. Like there's no rules to speak of. And so one interesting way that this kind of comes through in the way in which we talk about food and specifically meat is that um, because you had the farmers in England who were still speaking this like Saxon language, we have words like uh, sheep or cow or pig or um, swine. 
And then we have the French words arriving, which are things like pork or beef. So porc and boeuf. And so you're going to have both words coexisting at the same time. And how do you sort of work with that? Well, one is the one being spoken by the farmer, so the person who's raising the animal. And the other one is the one that's being spoken in the grand banquet halls. So the word used for the cuisine. Interesting. So a lot of the time, the live animal in English will have a Germanic root, and then the cooked presentation will have a French root, which is why a lot of people find it really weird that the French talk about the live animal and the meat in the plate with the same word, which we in English don't. And we think of it as like... But don't they though? Like they, we, cows are a vesh, but would you call a cow a boeuf? You could, yeah. Oh, really? If it was a male cow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so not a cow, a, 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 a bull. bull. Yeah. Interesting. But you would never call meat vash. No, you would never call meat vash. But vash is for uh, dairy, which we will okay. get to next week. Next week on the dairy train. Ah, uh, get aboard the dairy train. Choo choo. Trains are important too. Oh my god. Okay, <laughs> I have to stop nerding out on um, yeah. things that are not related. Oh, they're all trans- tangentially related. But here we go. Let me get myself back. It's my job to ch- to please reel me in. Spi- no, to spiral out. <laughs> <laughs> oh God hot mess of a podcast welcome uh-huh that's what everyone's into though i, I hope it's... i hope that's what you like because that's what you're gonna get that's what i'm into <laughs> so normandy is a uh, viking ish uh as you were saying you know france is kind of broken into segments and normandy becomes a french province province officially when um louis the 11th well basically louis the 11th has normandy who's a, the king of france he gives it to his brother charles in 1465 and then three years later takes it back and I have three siblings, so I totally know what that must have felt like. I want to know what happened. I also want to know what happened. I think it was like, Louis was like, oh, this is like this thing that I don't really want here. And then Charles is like, ooh, this is fun. And Louis is like, oh, actually, I changed my mind. Take it back. Yeah, that's probably exactly what happened. I really think so. It's like, oh, wait, you like this? Okay, no. Yeah, no, I have it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So... That's when Normandy sort of starts to become more French than Norman. I think that there are a lot of modern Normans today who would say to me, how dare you? And that's, you know, 600 years ago. But um, we basically start to have kind of assimilation into France with one major exception, which is that we have quite a lot of like Huguenot, so Protestant presence in uh, in Normandy historically, um, just because as we start to have Protestant reformations, there's a lot of French Calvinists and they are not necessarily welcome in all bits of France. But Henry IV, who is born a Protestant, converts to Catholicism. He purportedly said Paris is well worth a mass. And aside from <laughs> um, just being like, the tallest guy with the biggest dick, and that is, you know, uh, historically provable, or at least he talked about it a lot, and he fucked a lot of people. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And he was born a Protestant um, and converted to Catholicism. Because he wanted the biggest, fluffiest robe to go with it, and the fanciest the fanciest stuff. The prettiest high-heeled shoes. Catholicism is fancy. Yeah, the prettiest heels. The nicest tights. Mm. Henry IV was a pretty badass sort of guy. Um, And before being stabbed to death by a crazed monk in the streets of Paris, he converted to Catholicism, but kind of was like okay with certain Protestant stuff. So he granted religious liberty to Protestants, ending the wars of religion, which had begun in 1562 and lasted until 1685. And so you end up having a lot of Huguenots there when we revoke the Edict of Nantes, we, uh, the Huguenots are no longer really allowed to hang out in Normandy, so they flee to other more Protestant-friendly countries um, in Europe or elsewhere. I'll never understand this, uh, this take on Jesus. Right? <laughs> I like him best. No, I like him best. <laughs> Fuck you. Die. <laughs> My windows are pretty. We hate your pretty windows. Kill each other. I don't think so. If you are an avid reader like me, make sure to check out Storytime in Paris. This podcast by Jennifer Garrity is about any book with a French connection, and it's an opportunity for the audience to ask questions of the authors and hear the authors themselves talk about these Frenchy books It's on Paris Underground Radio. Now it's time for a word from the sponsors of the podcast. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. 
So, um, so we do have all this long-standing Viking presence in Normandy, and the Vikings are, you know, going to bring quite a few things over uh, to Normandy. And I think one in particular is of interest to you, Caroline. Yeah, I mean, I want to pipe in here to say the obvious. Well, it may not be obvious if you've never been to this part of France. So Normandy is up top. It's north. It's on the the north coast, um, the the North Sea, not the North Sea, the the Channel, right? Right. North Sea is a completely different place. It is, but we also it also bears noting that in the we all, we call it the English Channel everywhere but France, where they insist on calling it the Channel. The Channel, yeah, yeah. And so it's cold and it's wet and it's flat. These are things that are not good for wine. So this is not wine country. People think that there's wine everywhere in France, and there is wine in a lot of France, but there's not wine in Normandy. Normandy is not a wine place. So you know, we still got to get fucked up somehow. And really the the way that people would have drunk back in the day when we're talking really like medieval and b- before and what the Vikings would have been drinking would be would be beer. So Vikings drank beer. They weren't, um, it wasn't hopped. It would have been with barley and water. And it was definitely distinct from what the Gauls were drinking. So at this time, really all over the country, not just in, um, in Normandy, There was a drink that the Romans named Servoise um, after the goddess of agriculture, Ceres, which is probably where cereal comes from, I would assume. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. I read that. I'm like, yeah, okay, duh. So (laughs) this was not hopped also. Um, I'm not sure what the history of hops are, but we can find that out at a later date, I'm sure. And uh, it was made from barley and other cereals. And it was flavored with like herbs and spices. And the herbs and spices that you used would depend on obviously where you are and what you could get. And, you know, this was just sort of a low ABV drink that was more Mm -hmm. sanitary than water. This was something, the little herb, aromatic herb and spice blend would have been called gris. And that would change depending on where you were. This was stuff that was made by women. It was, you know, not considered particularly high quality. Um, But you know, the development of barrels. So when we talk about wine technology, um, the Gauls did invent barrels. That was the big contribution the French ultimately um, gave to to the Romans for wine. And so these barrels would have been made for this, this drink. But beer started picking up steam really in the Middle Ages. And again, we had, we had migration and mixing from, from the Netherlands, from Holland. We had brewers coming into the city of Dieppe, which is, which is in Normandy from Holland. And setting up these taverns. And this was considered higher quality than Servoise. It was more expensive and also made by men. <laughs> um, but it still was not considered as high value as wine. And we're not, uh, we are going to talk about cider, don't worry. But I figured I would have a little interjection about what people were drinking before before cider, before wine um, was, was accessible in this part of France. Yeah, and I will... Um just add to that too that there are uh so servoise is not something that you can like pop over to the local french pub and get today like there's no, no real servoise but there is one um i'm sure there are other producers i just happen to know about this one there's a, a parisian brewer called thomas deck he's from alsace where they also have a pretty strong beer brewing culture we'll talk about that on our alsace episode he is based in paris and he loves making sort of like historical styles of beer and so he has made like somewhere that t- some a, a drink that kind of toes the line between like an ale and a servoise that is hopped only slightly and then it, they use some herbs um for bitterness to sort of replicate or kind of just just to make a reference um to the servoise of yore so if you check out deck and donahue if you're in france they do not export they're too climate conscious for that Oh but, really? Um, yeah, they decided they're everywhere in Paris, though. I mean, if you're if they're you're in Paris, in Paris, they're everywhere. Yeah, I re- I've been drinking that stuff for a long time. It's really good. Yeah, you can get it at Monoprix. Yeah, and so you can definitely check that out. And they do um, do a Servoise kind of style beer, which is pretty cool to try. That is so. cool. So Normandy, we do have um, obviously this beer culture. We also have a lot of other sort of natural elements of the terroir. And terroir is this word that if you listen to this podcast, you're going to start to get sick of hearing. And yet we're (laughs) never going to stop saying it. Never. Because terroir is so important and essential, sort of the type of land you have, the history of the people who are there. Um, And specifically when we're talking about terroir in this context, I'm sort of referring more to the topography of Normandy, which is very, very rich and varied. So if you start kind of on the western side of Normandy, you obviously have, you know, the Atlantic coast. And so you're going to have a lot of seafood. You're going to have a lot of 
oysters. You're going to have scallops, mussels. Um, when you go to a restaurant in Normandy, you're going to see a lot of like fresh catch of the day. So, you know, that coast is going to provide quite a lot of food to the locals throughout history. And it's something you're going to recognize a lot on the plate. So yeah, if you head to Normandy, you will often see um, your local seafood and usually prepared with another ingredient that you find quite frequently in Normandy, which is going to be butter or cream. Mm. Um, that's something we're going to get into more detail in in the next episode because there's a lot to talk about with Normandy dairy. But suffice it to say, we do have a lot of pasture in Normandy. It's flat. It's very flat. It's very green. It's very rainy. So mm -hmm. lots of grass, lots of very happy animals. And so you have a lot also specifically um, in the Pays d'Oug, you have a lot of horse rearing. Now, these days, we're talking more about riding horses than eating horses, although we do indeed eat horse in this country. It's a thing. It's not a big thing anymore. It's not a big thing anymore. So essentially, I mean, when you think about it, it's like a big animal that you have on your land and when the horse gets too old to work you're not just going to like let it die a happy death and leave it there in your field like you're yeah. a poor farmer you only have one horse you're like oh sad our horse is dead let's make horse soup so that's pretty much what's going to happen in france very happily until pope gregory the third prohibits eating horse in 732 a.d the reality is that why because um it's so the the Bible is unclear about whether horse is actually clean to eat. So it's kind of a an idea of like obeying the, you know, the letter of the law of Leviticus, where it's like, don't also you shouldn't wear polyester. Also, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff in there that, you, you know, we, we can stone people to death and things like that. So 732 AD, we decide that the, the thing we're going to hang our hat on is don't eat horse. Mm hmm which the rich can do because they have lots of other choices. The poor are probably going to keep eating it, although it's technically illegal until 1866. Okay. I have never had it. So I've had it once. It's, you know, a little bit sweeter than beef. It's traditionally the meat that you use to make steak tartare. Really? Because it's a lot leaner than beef. Yeah. So steak tartare was invented as a way to eat horse. That's interesting. Now, you know, don't worry if you have if you have a problem with eating horse and you've come to Paris and eaten steak tartare, it will not be with horse. No. So we see a lot of horse butchery specifically following World War II. You know, that makes sense as well because we had a lot of shortages during World War II. But we are going to see a huge fall from popularity in the 1980s due in part to Brigitte Bardot, who, as we have previously established, sucks. She is the worst. She is the worst. But she did push people to stop eating horse. And she, like, produced a um, ad campaign where, like, a horse was crying. And I guess they had to, like, blow fans at his face to make him cry. Like, it was this whole thing. That sounds ethical. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But today, the, the fact of the matter is there's only about 600 horse butchers left in France. Most of the horse that we eat comes not from France, but from Romania or Canada. Weird. Really? Yeah. Hmm. And we do also produce horse for consumption in Texas. What? Oddly enough. <sighs> I know. Yikes. That's going to piss people off. Yes, it is. Welcome to the Terroir Podcast, where we piss you off with facts. It's funny. I'm not, I am not a horse person. I was, Me neither. Uh, my sisters are both horse people. They love horses. I was forced to give it a chance as a child and I know poor me, right? Oh no. I know. Forced to go horse. I fucking hated it though. I just wasn't my thing. Like I don't like being dirty. They smell, they're scary. They can fucking kill you. Like mm -hmm. I'm not into it now. Like I could fuck around with a trail ride. That could be nice. Like at least I know how to do it, I guess. But it's uncomfortable and weird. I, I don't connect with horses, but I know a lot of people do really form incredible bonds with horses. Right. And so I, I understand why people have a problem with it. It is not, I mean, I know people do form bonds with all animals, but it definitely is, I think, a different relationship when you are riding a horse and you, you know, you, you really depend on that, on that horse and they, they obviously love each other. So. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen um, like kids on uh, dairy farms becoming very att attached to cows as well. So I can <laughs> see how like it's not ideal. Um, but I mean, I, I have a sister who's horse people too. So these days you won't find it that often. It's kind of like uh, specifically because in when you go to butchery school, you don't actually learn how to butcher a horse. It's apparently very, very different oh, from butchering a cow. That's interesting. So 
yeah, because we don't want it, we have less need for horse butchery butchers. And because we have fewer horse butchers, we have less horse. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of. I literally like, I don't look for it, but I also don't see it. The only place that I really remember seeing it was when I was a chef in the Alps in the Borg Samaris Super U. There was like one thing of horse. There's, there was, there would be like one like horse steak, but there wasn't, it was like in the beef section and it was kind of innocuous. Like, but I, I've never, I've never looked for it here, but I bet, I mean, I wonder, I'll go into Monoprix and check. I find that it's much, I mean, I used to find it in my very, very big Monoprix. In Monoprix in central Paris, you definitely don't see it. You usually have to go to a horse butchery. They only will do horse. They'll have a horse head above the door to let you know what they're doing. And actually one of my favorite sandwich shops in Paris used to be a horse butchery and they are no longer, they don't sell horse. They just sell really good sandwiches. Um, They kept the horse head over the top. So kill for a fucking sandwich. We don't have sandwiches in Lyon. There's like a real lack of sandwiches in this city and it really makes me sad. Yeah, but I think you don't like French sandwiches in general. French sandwiches are terrible. and They have too much bread and not enough other stuff. Mm, fair enough. Fair enough. I come from the land of an Italian hero, so I know what you're talking about. But, <laughs> well, I mean, what you're saying is true too. Like these days, beef is a lot more common just throughout France and then specifically in Normandy, we have a lot of cattle and specifically this Normand breed, which is a descendant of cattle that were brought over by the Vikings. So it's a very specific local breed of cow. They're very beautiful. They're white and they have these kind of like reddish splotches and they can be a little bit blonde looking and they're delicious. Yum. (laughs) So good. They're famous for their marbling. Um, They can hold a lot of fat. And, you know, in France, the beef is by and large grass fed, which can mean it's a little bit tougher than what we find in the States. But really in Normandy, you get that awesome combination of like a uh, really, really rich flavor and also an excellent texture that you don't have to like chew it until next Tuesday. So delicious beef in Normandy. So in France, we do obviously have the normal cuts of beef, although we butcher beef differently in this country than you do in the U.S. Usually the idea in the U.S. is to avoid waste as much as possible. So you'll often have cuts that aren't even all the way through or that have different textures on them. Whereas in France, the ideal is to have cuts that are the same all the way through and that ha- so they have the same thickness and the same texture throughout the, same- the steak, which means that you end up with a little bit more waste, but we-, we do use all the waste. So anything that's cut away from a steak is either sold as stewing beef or ground beef. Um, and so we eat everything. And that includes, of course, the offal, the organ meats. The insides. Yeah. Tripe. Exactly. If you're enjoying this episode of the Terror Podcast, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Romancing in Paris. This podcast delves into everything you need to know about the city of love. The Terror Podcast will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to the Terror Podcast. Um, so do you eat tripe? I wish I was more into stuff like that because in mm-hmm. Lyon, we, we have a sausage called Andouillette that's a tripe sausage, and I think it smells like a public toilet and refuse to put it in my mouth, so no. Fair enough. I mean, so I actually really like Andouillette, but is the only tripe preparation that I like. I don't like, I don't really like the texture of tripe. It's kind of got like this uh, honeycomb kind of texture to it that I find really weird, but I'll eat all the others, like the... I don't buy it, but like if someone else makes me kidney or liver um, or sweetbreads, which I love. I like sweetbreads. I like like a liver pate. I don't want a liver steak. And I think kidneys smell like piss. I mean, they do. That's why you put them in like a really crazy sauce. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, I'm not into it. I'm not, I'm not keen it. on I'm not keen on the tripe or the kidneys. I like liver in a pate. I'm too American. Mm. And I don't think that's ever going to change. Fair enough. I ate brain once and that was really good. But again, I would never make it for myself. <laughs> my friend Christy made brain recently and posted oh on Instagram. Oh my God. Wow. That was intense. Well, specifically in Normandy, we do eat tripe in what they call a la mode de Caen. So Caen, not to be confused with Caen, um, is a city in Normandy. So it's spelled C-A-E-N. And traditionally, it's made with all four chambers of a cow's stomach and a part of the large intestine. That is... Uh, large intestine is no longer allowed um, since 1996, but it is still made. Why? Is that like foot, foot and mouth disease or something like that? Mad cow? I mean, no, that was brain, right? 
That was brain. So this is more to do with just being able to guarantee like the right sanitary conditions. Okay. Um, it's this kind of the same reason why in the US you're not allowed to sell lung. It's like, it's just too hard to guarantee it. And so they're like, no. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there's still people who eat it, but you're not allowed to sell it. Uh, you are, however, allowed to use like the hooves and the bones, which, you know, have all the lovely gelatin and collagen and everything. And you mix it all together with aromatics and a very, very large quantity of beef fat. And you end up with this sort of tripe stew um, that's very, very codified and regulated because it's France and we like to have rules about recipes. So there's actually a guild that gives out an award called the Tripière d'Or, the golden tripe every year uh, to the very best tripe à la mode de Caen that you can find throughout France. I hope that that never, ever passes my lips. I have no interest and it looks mm -hmm. disgusting. I, I'm Google imaging it now and it makes me want to die. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. It's it it looks it it's pretty it's pretty intense. I would eat it if, again if like if I had the guy who had won the Tripière d'Or making it for me, I would try it because I would want to know what the very very best version of this tripe stew was. But I've had tripe in like pho in like Vietnamese pho, and I love pho, but I avoid all the tripey bits. Like I just don't. I don't like the texture. I think it's really weird. Yeah. Tripe is, yeah, tripe is like not just a French thing. Like there's a lot of tripe in Mexican food and yeah, and pho and like it's not. Yeah. Italian food. We're just, I guess when you don't grow up with those textures, I think it's the texture that gets like the basic bitches from America, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like Oh, me. for me, it's a hundred percent the texture too. Like I just can't, it's just too weird. But, uh, so we have the, the Normand cow. Uh, so the Normand cow is one of the breeds. It, often in France, you have breeds that are specifically used for beef production and bre breeds that are specifically used for dairy production. Mm -hmm. The Normand is one of the, I wouldn't say rare, but one of the few that is very good for both. And so, you know, as I said, we're going to talk a lot more about dairy next week because the dairy in industry and the history of dairy in Normandy really does need its own episode. But suffice it to say that there is a lot of rich Normandy cream and butter here. And so usually when you see anything on like a restaurant menu, and this is something you'll see a lot on restaurant menus throughout France, a la something. So like a la basquez means in the Basque style. And that's usually going to mean like with tomatoes and peppers and onions, I think. Is that right? I, we need to do our Basque uh, episode and then we'll figure it out. We will do our Basque episode. I know it's onions and um, pepper, uh, sorry, peppers and tomatoes. And there might also be onions involved. A la Bordelaise will mean with a red wine sauce. And a la Normande means that it's going to have butter, cream, and apples. Apples? Apples. Apples is a major crop in Normandy. We have nearly 800 varieties of apples grown in Normandy alone, and it's got a long, rich history, and it's a huge part of Normandy terroir and food and drink. I love apples. And now we get into the booze corner again. Exactly. So we, we did briefly talk about beer, but you were just waiting for me to talk about cider. Oh, I really want you to talk about cider. <laughs> I love cider. And cider is actually really having a moment right now. Even in America, there's a lot of really great cider uh, companies. I my, One of my favorites is Golden State Cider in California. People are making a lot of dry cider. They're making a lot of ciders that are just really good. And I think that is because of gluten-free stuff. So like all the celiacs, all the like people that are trying to be healthy by not eating gluten and that like beer are shifting to cider. It's lower ABV than wine. And so it's a really good option. That's just my little cider moment. I love cider. So first orchards in Normandy are probably planted in around the 8th century. Thanks, Emily, for those notes. <laughs> and the first mention of local cider is in 1082. It is suggested by historians that there's an influence from Basque Country, which also is famous for their cider. And uh, that is something that really, this is a product that, again, like a lot of wines, and we see this again and again, the quality is just improved by the medieval monks who kind of take over and make it their thing and really like figure out how to do it the best way. So you and I would have been buddies with monks in the I know. medieval because it's like they were making all the booze and all the cheese. Like we just need to go hang out. But we wouldn't have been allowed in there because we're ladies. Ugh, I know. Couldn't we be nuns? We can we pretend can, nuns. Pretend nuns. But I still don't mm. think nuns and monks hung out. I don't fucking know. Probably not. Um, they didn't want to risk anyone getting frisky. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Normandy, obviously, as I said before, is not a grape place. It's cold and flat, so it's much better for apples. So 
you know, anytime we talk about like, the invention of a thing, you know, people were probably making fermented drinks with apples before the 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 idea of cider is this concept that was widespread probably happened but really again medieval period it's improved and it's a thing and what's interesting is that the cider production really boomed in the 1800s in the 1800s and beyond because of phylloxera so when phylloxera which we talked about in our last episode which was the um the the grape which we're going to talk about again and again and again we're going to talk about phylloxera i mean you can't talk about wine without talking about phylloxera you cannot talk about the history of wine without talking about phylloxera It is so integral to what the modern wine industry is that it's impossible So basically all the vineyards die all over the world, but really, you know, really bad in France, basically almost all the vineyards die. There's no wine. And so the cider producers are like, Hey, 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 the Hamilton song. I could sing. I would have come in with hopeless, but I can't again, people shouldn't drive with me. People shouldn't listen to me sing. I love to drive and sing at the same time. So no one wants to be in that car either. The, uh, yeah. So big deal. Phylloxer kills every, all the vines. And then cider is like, Hey guys. And now it's still a big thing. It's, I would, say that it's not as popular it is not considered to be as high-end as wine that is for sure and i think there's a lot of craft beer now that's having a moment in france which is cool cider i think is still pretty cheap there is really good cider like there obviously are producers that are really good that are more expensive for the most part it's cheap it's really cheap and it's really low alcohol so let's talk a little bit about how this works so we are also now again in an aoc system we talked about this last time we're going to talk about it again and again the appellation system appellation d'origine contrôlée sometimes it's aop appellation d'origine protégée protected versus controlled it's the same thing these are legal designations that define a method of production they define the species of cow or in this case the variety of apple they define a boundary on a map so in this part of france we have the pay dog AOC. And they also have something called IGPs here, which we will see also in other parts of France. And IGP, if we imagine the AOC system like a pyramid with AOC at the top, IGP is the next level down. And so that's a similar structure, but with fewer restrictions and a bigger area. And then beneath that, we would have, you know, like a product of France. They are, you know, in theory, quality tiers, but there's a lot of great stuff that's made that's IGP just because it's on the wrong side of the fence. So I think that's really important. And that's important with wine too. In Normandy, with the cider apples, we're making three different drinks. So cider is one of them. We have brut versus du. So brut is going to be dry. Du, D-O-U-X, is going to be sweet. Um, Often these are drunk. I mean, you can drink this stuff for breakfast. It's only three to 5% ABV. It's cheap. It's delicious. It's something that I think is really drunk you know a lot i mean emily do you like cider i love cider and um you know i i love it specifically with a lot of the products that come from normandy i think it can work really well but i also just think it's a really nice thing to have like on a hot day Mm -hmm. when you know you don't i don't know for some reason you don't feel like drinking rosé maybe you had some had too much yesterday you don't want beer it's like it's got a slight sweetness it's fruity it's lovely i love it i'm i'm a big fan yeah i think it's delicious we do also have something called Calvados. So Calvados is a distilled apple brandy and Calvados is also AOP protected. So the first mention of Calvados is from our uh, squire, Gilles de Gouberville. I'm going to call him Gouberville. I like that. I think you should. I like, I like that. That should be the name of a town. Gouberville. That's a, That is the name of a town in like Indiana, right? It must be, right? I'm from Gooberville, Indiana. Um, I bet it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, my, my dad's from Indiana. I'm allowed to make fun of Indiana. So <laughs> Gilles de Gouberville in 1553 is the first record of distilling cider and turning it into this liquor. Um, it caught on real quick. So within 50 years, there's a guild for distillation in 1606. The Calvados area is created after the revolution. And like cider, the output increased a lot during phylloxera because the grape brandy was also really affected by phylloxera, you know, Cognac, Armagnac, those are made from grapes. So Calvados is like, hi. And then it was, uh, this is a fun fact. They were requisitioning Calvados to make explosives during World War I because it's so high alcohol. Oh, wow. It's it's liquor. It's liquor. Right. It is, but it, it is, it does taste like apples. I mean, it's fucking delicious. I, I really, I really like Calvados. I love Calvados. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, the AOC was protected in 1942, which is is you know the AOC system kind of starts coming in in like the 20s I think or the first one so it's it's on the early side and then AOC Pedog is um that's more restricted 
So AOC Calvados is slightly less restrictive. You can use a column still and do a continuous distillation. But if you're AOC Pedog, it's going to be double distilled in a traditional copper alambic still. And that, you know, people say that that makes it a better quality and you keep more apple flavor, whereas some, some people prefer the sort of cleaner style of the continuous still. And then these are going to be aged for a minimum of two years in oak. So there's often a little bit of a vanilla vibe, something sort of spicy. And then we do also have pears. I mean, I think it's important to say that pears are important here too. We make perry, which is cider from basically from pears. And most of the perry would also still have a base of apples. But Domfranc is an AOC that is a liquor that it comes from 30% pairs. So we do ha- even have, you know, smaller AOCs that are particularly special. And like brandy, Calvados has quality tiers. So we have um, VS, which is two year minimum aging. We have Vieux or Reserve, which is three years. VO or Vieille Reserve or VSOP. You could see any of those on it are four years aging. And then when you get to the really good shit, that's extra XO, Napoleon, Ordage, Très Vieille Reserve, That's going to be minimum of six years, but on something like this, it's always going to be a lot more. And these are liquors that can be aged for a very, very long time. So this is not something that is, you know, if you're, if you're getting an XO, it's not going to be six years, probably more like 15, you know, Um, I've never had an aged Calvados. I've only had VS and they do taste really appley. So I would love to taste older Calvados and yeah, I don't know. I've never had the opportunity. So I actually have had the opportunity and the opportunity that I had was at a uh, cider house slash Calvados producing facility in um, Normandy uh, called Verger de Romilly. And they have actually had apple farms on their property that date back as far as William the Conqueror. And we actually are lucky enough to have Benjamin Renault, who is the son of the uh, former owners who's taking over the business himself, here on the podcast to tell us a little bit more about the crafting and the sort of unique nature of his production in Normandy. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, Benjamin. First, I know that you work um, on a family production that's very, very old. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of your particular production? Actually, it is my mother, Cécile Renault, who pushed hard to take over the the business on on cider. She started with about 5,000, 6,000 bottles a year in the 80s to reach nowadays more than 120 thousand bottles of cider that's just for the cider because uh we do also some calvados which is distillation of cider when the mother started the business of cider production she had some apple trees from the grandfather and then she discovered that on the market of the plants only bretagne apples were available on on sales so she started to grow her own apples with some colleagues doing cider to recreate, to refine the, the, the local Norman varietals of apple. And it took them about 20 years to, to find back all those old varietals of apple. Wow. And you have had apples growing on your land for a very long time, right? Even though yep. your, your farm is three generations, but the apples have been there for a long time. Yeah, yeah. When I took over the business, the parents were with 14 acres of orchard. An acre of land in France is 1,000 meter per 1,000 meter. You can plant, on average, 600, 700 apple trees on this hectare. Nowadays, we double the production. Uh, My surface is about 33 hectares of orchard, okay? Mm -hmm. And when she started the plantation, she was about with about 4 hectares of orchard. So we, we are constantly increasing the capacity of production of the farm by planting new trees. How many different varieties of apples do you grow on your land? Well, you have to understand that to have a, a good cider, you need different varietals of apple. There is four big families. There is the sweet apples, the bitter sweet, the bitter and the acidulated apples. And then you have the subcategories, the varieties themselves. The varietals the people are used to will be the Granny Smith, the Pink Lady, the Fuji apple. Those apples are unpicked into the trees. Our apples have to fell on the ground before being harvested. It means they are ready. And also it's tiny, tiny apples. Um, should be three times less than, than the classic regular apple you are used to. And so we are working in total on this farm with about 30 varietals of apple. We will use about uh, 16 of them just for the cider. 
Now, I was really interested in what you said about your mom really pushing for focusing on apples and cider and Calvados. Is that a story that you think is quite common in your part of Normandy? Well, yes. Usually the guy here, they have the land, they have the buildings, they have the skills. But usually by the time they were doing a lot of different products for their own consumption, the cider, they were doing also meat, uh, milk. Yes, it was common to be on different products and productions. With time, the people tend to focus on, on certain production and to be master of this kind of production. I know that you started making a few newer cocktail kind of beverages and even a honey made from cider. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Oh, yeah, the confit de cidre. The confit de cidre is a reduction of cider. So with the leftover of cider you have, you, you cook them with some sugar in a copper pan for five, six hours, slow cook. And then you obtain a syrupy caramel with a taste of cider. It's fantastic. It's like a honey. Is there anywhere that people can find you and taste at home? That's quite recent. We are starting the online sales of our products. That's working quite well. And due to the COVID crisis, they, they increased the, the, the orders on, online because they weren't able to come to the farm as they are doing every year. So we just recently uh, started this, which is, which is very cool. It's a, it's a new adventure for us. But um, so far, we have to sell only in Europe. It's really tricky to sell alcohol abroad out of Europe for the moment for us, for a small company as we are. And now I'm quite proud to say that we are shipping about 20 pallets every year to USA. And those products are available in New Jersey, New York for the moment, and some other states. If you want to have more details, you should visit romilicidre.com, which is their website. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for telling me so much about your production. I just have one last question for you before I let you go. And that sure. is, if you were to imagine the ideal pairing, the ideal food to enjoy with your cider that you make, what is your favorite thing to eat when you're having a glass of your cider? <laughs> I like to drink my extra dry cider because we are really close to my grandfather's cider taste, the real Norman cider. And this cider pairs perfectly with some cheese. You can take some camembert, the pavé d'Isigny, which is a soft cheese here with the, the red skin, orange skin. Uh, it's a specialty of Isigny, which is the, the closest city, village here, uh, with some andouille. The andouille de vire, that's really specific. It's sort of a sausage made with guts of uh, animals. <laughs> Voilà, it's a very... Sounds delicious. It is. Actually, it is. Uh, yes, yes. The taste is very strong, but it's so cool with the cheese, the cider, and yes, yes it's, that's the, the match. Amazing. Thank you so much. Now, if you guys know me at all, you know that I'm a little woo-woo. I'm a little woo-woo up in here. So if you're a little woo-woo too, you need to make sure to check out Annette Deleuze's podcast, The Heart of You, on the Paris Underground Radio. Annette goes into everything spiritual, and it's been just a blast listening to season one. Can't wait for season two. Now it's time for a word from the sponsors of the podcast. And now, back to the Terroir Podcast. So I think that what's really interesting, I've, I have had the opportunity to have the super aged one. And I think what's really interesting about it is that it does kind of, I think it kind of loses apple quality and it starts to resemble a lot of other brandies where you can't necessarily tell, you, you get more of the vanilla notes, you get more of the kind of um, rich, heady kind of alcohol character, and you lose a little bit of that kind of I mean, it, 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 to me, Calvados, it can, you can drink it any time, but there's something really lovely and autumnal about it. And maybe that's because I'm from the Northeast, or maybe that's just because, you know, there's something in my brain that makes me want to have apples in the fall. But when you have a really lovely, not too aged Calvados, you really do still get those apple characters that I think you kind of lose as it gets older. And maybe that makes me like an uncouth, you know, basic bitch, but I actually kind of prefer the, the younger Calvados that still has a little bit more of that apple character. Yeah, I think that's I think that's interesting because it is, you know, it's the same with like old wine. You know, we wine geeks love old wine, but the older it gets, the more it kind of all tastes the same. And it tastes awesome. I mean, it's, it tastes like zombies clawing their way out of the grave, but I love it. 
but it's um you know it's it's interesting if you have i mean i've i've had some bordeaux from the 50s and like you know the difference between a petrus and a lafitte in that moment is pretty minimal um, and but it, it gets this like nutty funk that you can really only get on aging and so it's different it's different it does not have the same freshness it's not going to keep its fruit in the same way but I would love to try some old Calvados and see what that's like. And w- in terms of Calvados, like in the, because in France, what's interesting is that they also have like a time of of the meal in which they drink different things. Just is Calvados like more of a pre dinner drink or like a digestif, like a post dinner drink? Well, so Calvados is you know it's it's liquor, so it's definitely something that goes into cocktails these days. And we are so excited to have Forrest Collins on sharing her recipe for a fall fashion that is all about Calvados. Forrest is a cocktail expert living in Paris, and you can find her at 52 Martinis. Well, as you know, we have a country house, Le Perche, which is just in front of the Normandy border. So while we're not technically in the border, we're still in the area and we're in apple country. And so I have a, a cocktail I'm really excited to share that's inspired by all of this called the Fall Fashioned. I always like an old fashioned. I think it's a great classic cocktail that's really nice to put on a menu, but also a template that allows to play around a lot. I just really wanted to create something for my home menu for my house cocktail that really highlighted the beauty of an old fashioned and how it can celebrate, you know, what I love about the the agricultural aspect around where our house is. I created something called a fall fashioned. It is basically an old fashioned that is made with Calvados. And um, I also use brown sugar syrup and I pour it over a little smoked ice. My recipe is six parts Calvados, one part brown sugar syrup, which is just equal parts brown sugar and water mixed together I also sometimes use maple syrup. It just depends. I know, especially if listeners are in France, it might be harder to find one or the other of those. Both of them work really nicely. And then I use several dashes of whiskey aged bitters. You know, you can use Angostura. You can play around with your bitters if those if those aren't something that you can find easily. You're going to mix all of those together over a large block of smoked ice in a rocks glass and then express a lemon, lemon peel over it. So you take your lemon peel and you just kind of squeeze it so the oils shoot out and land on top of the cocktail. And so I think that it really balances out nicely the apple flavor of the Calvados and gives it a little tiny bright note. So side note for the ice, when I say smoked ice, what I generally do is I have a smoking gun. And if you are not like a big cocktail nerd, you may not have one at home. You can still do it otherwise. But if you are, you take your smoking gun, you make ice cubes, you put them in a Ziploc bag, you get the smoke from your smoking gun, fill that bag, seal it up, you let the ice melt, and then you refreeze it. The really super duper lazy and easy way is if you want to buy some liquid smoke and app, add a drop to each of your ice cubes before you put them in the freezer. There you go. I mean, nobody, the cocktail police are not going to come and get you if you don't do it with a smoking gun. And I think that kind of wraps it up. There is also a mixed drink that is pretty fun called Pomo. So this is a newer product on the market. It's something that probably was always done, but the first recorded try to market it, which I actually found on the, um, the, you know, website, you know, is the body that, that controls the Appalachians. And the first record to try to market it was in 1946, but it was rejected because at that time it was illegal to sell and market cider based mixed drinks. And so (laughs) they, they didn't want to do it. And then it finally got the right to sell it in 1981, and then it got AOC status in 1991. So this is a mix of apple juice and Calvados that basically goes up to about 16 to 18%. So it's a lot more in line with with wine, although it's it's stronger than wine. And then it's aged for a minimum of 14 months in barrel. It is sweet, so it has a minimum of 69 grams per liter of sugar, which is which is pretty sweet. I mean, it's not super sweet, but it's it's definitely sweet. And Yeah, it's something that um, is kind of fun and different. So I don't think I've ever had it. So I've had it before. It's kind of similar in in like mindset to other like apero aperitif style drinks that place that other French regions make with their distilled liquor. So like you often find, you know, in a in like Charente, for example, they have like a a grappa that they mix with grape juice and they end up making Pinot de Charente, which is like I've had that. There you go. So you so it's like that, um, except it's more apple-y. And I think, I mean, it's interesting what you said about the apple juice, because I think, you know, in America, we we often find ourselves categorizing ciders based on whether they're alcoholic or not, like hard cider and not hard cider. But in France, you don't have a word for non-alcoholic cider. You just call it juice. So when we're saying apple juice, we're not talking about like 
apple juice concentrate, like the stuff, the Mott's stuff, like it's like cloudy, um, like real apple juice, like soft cider that they're mixing with the Calvados. So you end up with something that really tastes very, very apple But they're not putting any spices or anything in it. No. Because no. for me, like in America, a cider that was non-alcoholic would be apple juice with spices and hot. I see. Whereas I've had like the, like if you go up to like some of the apple farms, like in New England, you can buy apple cider and it's really just cloudy apple juice. Really? That's funny. Yeah. yeah that's in California, like apple cider is hot and it's with a cinnamon stick and it comes in a packet. <laughs> yeah. And you do have that here. They, I mean, not in a packet, but they have mulled cider at like some of the, um, the Christmas markets and stuff. Yeah, but they'll put booze in that. <laughs> oh yeah. That they gonna, spike. <laughs> they're going to put some brandy in that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, I, I would love to try Pomo. It sounds pretty yummy. And I think there is one other kind of interesting thing that people do with Calvados um, in Normandy uh, called a trou normand. Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, this is something that actually many of you have probably had before if you've ever eaten at a fancy restaurant and maybe gotten a tasting menu. It's um, it's called, I love the, the translation, the Norman hole. <laughs> and it is, it's a shot of Calvados in between courses. And so the concept was, and this is something that is a long, old, old tradition. They've been doing it for a long time. It's the idea is that having a shot in between courses makes you feel less full. And these days, if you're going to get a true normal, it would probably be in a little cup with some like pear or sorbet. So that might've been what you may have had at a restaurant. If you've had it, it would be like in a little coop and it would have a small ball of sorbet with a shit with a little bit of Calvados. So I think that's kind of funny because yeah, they're just like, let's take a shot between courses. And so the hole is that it makes a hole in your belly. I mean, which given the way that the Normans cook makes a lot of sense to me because we're going to have a lot of cheese and a lot of cream and a lot of butter, which are some of my favorite things to come out of Normandy. But to hear more about them, you're going to have to tune in uh, next week. If you are a cheese head, you got to tune in next week. And I'm going to let that episode really, I'm going to let you run with that, Emily. You're the cheese expert, but I will be piping in to talk about how to pair wine with these kinds of creamy cheeses, because I think most people are doing it wrong. Thank you for listening to the Terroir Podcast on Paris Underground Radio. Come back next week for a new episode. And if you love this podcast, make sure to rate, subscribe, and review us. It really, really helps us get to more people. Tell your friends about it, share it, and spread the word. Make sure to head to Instagram and follow me at Wine Dine Caroline and Emily at Emily underscore in underscore France. That is not to be confused with Emily in Paris. Cheers. This episode of the Terroir Podcast was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.